Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to Bhaktiville. Tonight, joining us are Bhaktimimulus, Ocean Boris, and Kandita is here via phone. <laughs> Her computer's broken, so we're, we're using speakerphone today. So welcome, everyone. Uh, last week, we started reading a new book, The Teachings of Queen Kunti, which is based on a conversation between Lord Krishna and his aunt, Queen Kunti. We read the introduction and looked over the family tree. We'll take a look at that family tree again tonight because it's just so interesting how everyone's connected. The book itself has a series of color illustrations at the beginning, two of which pertain to chapter one, which we're reading tonight. So we'll look at those. And after that, we'll jump right into the text of the book. The PDF page is page 36, and the book number is page 1. But before we begin, let me offer my obeisances to Srila Prabhupada and the Vaishnavas. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Dinamini. I offer my respectful obeisances under His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who is very dear to Lord Krishna having taken shelter at his lotus feet. Vancha kalpa tarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhevacha patitanam pavanebhyo vaishnavebhyo namo namaha. I also offer my respectful obeisances unto the Vaishnava devotees, oops, Vaishnava devotees of the Lord here and everywhere. They are just like desire trees and can fulfill the desires of everyone. And they are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. Sorry, I had a bug on my face. What's going on here? All right, bug's gone. Moved on to another part of the living room. All right, so let's look at the family tree. I have the family tree up there on the on the um, board, but there's also a link to that uh, in the note card if you'd like to look at it online instead of trying to squint over at that little thing there. Um, what I wanted to point out again is that um, Queen Kunti is Krishna's aunt because she is the sister of, of um, Vasudev. And Vasudev is Krishna's father. So that's the connection there. And Queen Kunti actually had four boys. She was married to Pandu, who was unable to have children. And she was given a boon by Surya to have children by Niyoga, which is by mantra. And so she didn't believe it, so she invoked it, and boom, she had a child named Karna. And she was embarrassed because she was unmarried and a teenager. And so she um, placed Karna in a basket on the river, just like Moses, you know, just like lots of other stories. And he was adopted by a couple who worked for Dhritarashtra. So that's what happened with Karna. But her other sons are Yudhisthira by way of Yama and Bhima by way of Vayu and Arjuna by way of Indra. And then her co-wife, Madri, had two sons, Nikula and Sahadev, who were by way of the Ashvins. So there are five Pandus, and Karna doesn't really play into the story, uh, plays into the story in the Mahabharata, but not as one of the brothers of those four, five brothers. So those five brothers are cousins, Krishna's cousins. So I just want to emphasize that family relationship, what's going on with this story. So then let's look at the first verse that we have tonight. And I think I can reach this. Yep, there it is. All right, so the first verse is there up on the board. And I'd like to go through word for word before I read the Sanskrit. So. Kunti Uvacha, as Srimati Kunti said, Namasya, let me bow down. Purusham, the Supreme Person. Tva, you. Adyam, the original. Ishvaram, the controller. Prakritehe, 
of the material cosmos, Param, beyond, Alaksham, the invisible, Sarva, all, Bhutanam, of living beings, Antaha, within, Vahi, without, Avastitam, existing. So the verse is Kunti Uvacha, Namasye Purusham Tvadyam, Ishvaram Prakriti Parama, Laksham Sarva Bhutanam, Antar Bahir Avastitam. English translation is Srimati Kunti said, O Krishna, I offer my obeisances unto you because you are the original personality and are unaffected by the qualities of the material world. You are existing both within and without everything, yet you are invisible to all. And this is from Srimad Bhagavatam 1818. And before we get going to reading the, the text itself in the book, there are some uh, colored illustrations that I thought we would look at first because they kind of lay out the the, um, the basis for the story, what's going on around. So there's this first plate where Quinty is um, there talking to Krishna. He's in the chariot waiting, waiting to go, and she's down standing next to him. Other people are around because he's leaving. No one's happy. So plate one, the text is, I think we have the text on the, on the board also. Lord Krishna, having delivered the Pandavas from many calamities and seeing that all his plans were now fulfilled, Lord Krishna was again preparing to leave. For years, Duryodhana had tormented Queen Kunti's family but Krishna had protected them at every turn, and now he was going away. Kunti was overwhelmed, and she approached Krishna to offer him prayers from the core of her heart. And then the next illustration is this one, with um, Krishna laying on the causal bed, the causal ocean. And then there's Krishna up there and Krishna Loka and then all the little uh, universes down below him. And the text that goes with that is, As Queen Kunti begins her prayers, she immediately reveals her knowledge of Lord Krishna's exalted divine nature. O Krishna, I offer my obeisances unto you because you are the original personality and are unaffected or the qualities of the material world. You are existing both within and without everything, yet you are invisible to all. Which is the verse that we just read. So let me continue on with the text. Srimati Kunti Devi was quite aware that Krishna is the original personality of Godhead, although he was playing the part of her nephew. Such an enlightened lady could not commit a mistake by offering obeisances unto her nephew. Therefore, she addressed him as the original Purusha, beyond the material cosmos. Although all living entities are also transcendental, they are neither original nor infallible. The living entities are apt to fall down under the clutches of material nature, but the Lord is never like that. In the Vedas, therefore, he is described as the chief among all living entities. Nityo nityanam chetanas chetananam. And that whole verse, the next part of that verse is Eko bahunam yo vidadati kaman. And this is quoted both in the Kata Upanishad and the Svetashvatara Upanishad. And the complete meaning of that uh, verse is the Supreme Lord is eternal and the living beings are eternal. The Supreme Lord is cognizant and the living beings are cognizant. The difference is that the Supreme Lord is supplying all the necessities of life for the many other living entities. So nitya nityanam 
Chaitanas Chaitana Nam. That's the section where the Supreme Lord is eternal and the living entities are eternal. Then again, he is addressed as Ishvara or the controller. The living entities or the demigods like Chandra and Surya, the moon and the sun, are also to some extent Ishvara, but none of them is the supreme Ishvara or the ultimate controller. Krishna is the Parameshvara or the super soul. He is both within and without. So within, in you, in your heart, and outside all around us. Although he was present before Srimati Kunti as her nephew, he was also within her and everyone else. In the Bhagavad Gita 1515, the Lord says, quote, I am situated in everyone's heart, and only due to me one remembers, forgets, and is cognizant, etc. Through all the Vedas I am to be known because I am the compiler of the Vedas, and I'm, I am also the teacher of the Vedanta. End quote. Queen Kunti affor affirms that the Lord, although both within and without all living entities, or uh, living beings, is still invisible. The Lord is, so to speak, a puzzle for the common man. Queen Kunti experienced personally that Lord Krishna was present before her. Yet he entered within the womb of Uttara to save her embryo from the attack of Ashvatama Brahmastra. Kunti herself was puzzled about whether Sri Krishna is all pervasive or localized. In fact, he is both, that he reserves the right of not being exposed to persons who are not surrendered souls. This checking curtain is called the Maya energy of the Supreme Lord and it controls the limited vision of the rebellious soul. It is explained as follows. Any questions or comments about that, about that verse? Or what's said in that verse? No? Dr. Mimula says, no, not so far. Ocean says, no, but it brings up some questions for myself personally. I am reading along on the website, too. Okay, good. Yeah, this, this, the, the story of Queen Kunti is so interesting because she goes through so many trials and tribulations and, you know, they're trying to kill her. They burn the house down. They, she has to run and hide. And she's got these boys that she's pulling along with her, these five boys. And, um, but at the same time, she's completely dependent on Krishna. And so it's, and she prays, you know, please put me in more trouble. So I'll think about you even more often. So um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting story. All right. All right, I'll go on to the second one. Oh, before I do, let's change this screen. Wait, two. Okay, number two. Kandita, did you want to say something? No. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, let me get to. Second one. All right, the second verse. I'll do the word for word first. Maya, deluding, Javanika, curtain, Achanam, covered by, Agnya, ignorant, Adokshajam, beyond the range of material conception or transcendental, Avyayam, irreproachable, Na, not. Lakshya se observed Mudhadrisha by the foolish observer Nataha artist Natya Dharaha dressed as a player Yata as This is from Srimad Bhagavatam one eight nineteen. So it's just the series of of um verses one after the other. Let me get to my text. 
All right, so in Sanskrit it is Maya Javanika Chanam Agya Dokshajam Avyayam Nalaksha Se Mudha Drisha Nato Natya Dharu Yata. Translation Being beyond the range of limited sense perception, you are the eternally irreproachable factor covered by the curtain of diluting energy. You are invisible to the foolish observer, exactly as an actor dressed as a player is not recognized. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Sri Krishna affirms that less intelligent persons mistake him to be an ordinary man like us, and thus they deride him. The same is confirmed herein by Queen Kunti. The less intelligent persons are those who rebel against the authority of the Lord. Such persons are known as asuras. The asuras cannot recognize the Lord's authority. When the Lord himself appears among us as Rama, Asringa, Varaha, or in his original form as Krishna, he performs many wonderful acts which are humanly impossible. As we shall find in the 10th canto of this great literature, Lord Sri Krishna exhibited his humanity his humanely, oh, let me start that over. As we shall find in the 10th canto of this great literature, Lord Sri Krishna exhibited his humanly impossible activities even from the days of his lying on the lap of his mother. He killed the Putana witch, although she smeared her breast with poison just to kill the Lord. The Lord sucked her breast like a natural baby, and he sucked out of her very life also. Similarly, he lifted the Govardhan hill, just as a boy picks up a frog's umbrella, and stood several days continuously just to give protection to the residents of Vrindavan. These are some of the superhuman activities of the Lord described in the authoritative Vedic literatures like the Puranas, the Itihasas, histories, and the Upanishads. He has delivered wonderful instructions in the shape of the Bhagavad Gita. He has shown marvelous capacities as a hero, as a householder, as a teacher, and as a renouncer. He is accepted as the Supreme Personality of Godhead by such authoritative personalities as Vyasa, Devala, Asita, Narada, Madhva, Shankara, Ramanuja, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Jiva Goswami, Vishvanatha Chakravarti, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and all other authorities of the line. He himself has declared as much in many places of the authentic literatures. And yet, there is a class of men with demonic mentality who are always reluctant to accept the Lord as the supreme absolute truth. This is partially due to their poor fund of knowledge and partially due to their stubborn obstinacy, which results from various misdeeds in the past and present. Such persons could not recognize Lord Sri Krishna even when he was present before them. Another difficulty is that those who depend more on their imperfect senses cannot realize him as the Supreme Lord. Such persons are like the modern scientist. They want to know everything by their experimental knowledge. But it is not possible to know the Supreme Person by imperfect experimental knowledge. He is described herein as adokshaja, or beyond the range of experimental knowledge. All our senses are imperfect. We claim to observe everything and anything, but we must admit that we can observe things under certain material conditions only, which are also beyond our control. The Lord is beyond the observation of sense perception. Queen Kunti accepts this deficiency of the conditioned soul, especially of the woman class, who are less intelligent. For the less intelligent, there must be such things as temples, mosques, or churches, so that they may begin to recognize the authority of the Lord and hear about him from authorities in such holy places. For the less intelligent, this beginning of spiritual life is essential, and only foolish men decry the establishment of such places of worship. 
which are required to raise the standard of spiritual attributes for the mass of people. For less intelligent persons, bowing down before the authority of the Lord, as generally done in the temples, mosques, or churches, is as beneficial as it is for the advanced devotees to meditate upon him by active service. Any questions? Comments? No. Candita says no. No, Ocean says no, but very interesting. I also, uh, whenever I see that women are in that less intelligent category, it kind of upsets me. Um, I think in the Western countries, women are not less intelligent. They're just as intelligent. Um, but in countries where women are not educated, I could see that that might, that might be true. <laughs> you noticed that I was kind of stopping there as I was reading it. Yes, I was. Um, and, and Prabhupada says that everyone benefits by coming to churches and temples. Everyone benefits from bowing down, advanced or not. Um, humbling yourself. I remember the first time I bowed down, I was, I was shaking. I'd never bowed down like that before. And it was very humbling. Ocean says, in the West, there's typically a common social understanding that ignorance is bliss. So acting slow or uneducated tends to be a more attractive attribute. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. So, but I think Prophet's pretty clear about what in, what intelligence is in all of his writings. So I don't, I don't really, uh, I'm not so concerned about it anymore. Can I add something to that? Yes, let me move the phone up to the microphone. So this is Kandita speaking. Go ahead. Um, I have a god sister named uh, Gopananda Kari. She was a Sankirtan devoted book distributor in the airports in Los Angeles. And when Srila Prabhupada uh, was there, um, he was sitting in the um, one of the chairs to get ready to leave. And he saw her uh, distributing books in, in front of him. She was just passing by doing her service where all the devotees were gathered around Prabhupada. And um, this reporter asked Prabhupada, uh, she said, I have heard that you said women are less intelligent and, um, uh, and that uh, men's brains are 64 ounces and women's brains are 32 ounces. And, you know, I have a hard time believing that, you know. And then, so Prabhupada looked at Gopananda Kari walking by with, a, she had a luggage cart filled with um, a box of Prabhupada's books and Prabhupada's books in her arm. And she was going from, uh, you know, various people to talk to them about the books and to distribute them and so he looked at Gopananda Kari and he turned back to her and he said she has 64 ounces she has a brain of that 64 ounces so I think it's a spiritual thing too yeah. you know I mean it doesn't matter but he said right there that she's a devotee. She's being acting in the most intelligent way, and for her, her brain was sixty-four ounces. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that with you. A lot of devotees don't know about that. That's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great story. So yeah. Um, Dr. Mimulus says, it makes some men feel better. Yes, it's true, it does. <laughs> but the intelligence is uh, knowing Krishna and offering service to, to him and Sri Krishna, or to Sri Guru. 
that's the intelligence. We don't really have enough time to start the next verse, so would you like to discuss anything else or add anything else? It did go fast, didn't it? I'm trying to add more stories as I'm reading so that it's not just reading, that it's embellished a bit. Lucian says, I'm not fond of separative politics, to be honest. Separative, you mean men are this way and women are that way? Men versus women, now me either. Yeah, anything, he says anything like that. Yeah, me either. I mean, one of the... Ocean says, it just causes divisiveness. Yes. Dr. Mimula says, we need each other. Ocean says, us versus them, etc. Yes, I agree. I agree. I agree. Kandita agrees. Um, one of the attractive things to me when I first joined was that we're all spirit soul, we're not this body. And that, for me, just leveled the playing, leveled the playing field that, oh, okay, so I can really do anything I want in devotional service and I'm good to go. Ocean says, but I do appreciate the distinction between those who are surrendered versus those who are not because that part made me question my own motives and intentions. Yes. Yes, I can see that. Surrendered versus those who are not. Yeah, when I was younger, whenever they said, the Krishna conscious person, and I thought, oh, that's me. I'm good, I'm golden. And as I've gotten older, I've seen, oh, he means pure devotees, not, not me. <laughs> Ocean says, if I'm not fully surrendered, then I'm just deluding myself. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm not that Krishna conscious person Prabhupada's referring to in the text. He's referring to the surrendered pure devotees there. Dr. Mimula says, especially in chapter 12. We just finished chapter 12, didn't we, Bhakti Mimulus? Yes, that's the one. It was a good chapter. All right, well, it's 6.30, and I appreciate all of you coming and discussing this chapter, adding your, your realizations. Ocean says, thank you for the reading. You're very welcome. Thank you. And Kandita, you're welcome. Thank you. So every Friday night, we're here at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And uh, Sunday at 10, we have Bhagwat Arkhamarichi Mala that we're reading. And on <laughs> Bhakti Mimi says, I'm not always late for that one. Yes, no, you're always on time. And Tuesday at 7 p.m., we have Bhagavad Gita, and we're doing chapter starting chapter 13 this week. All right. Thank you again, everyone. Take care. Have a great week. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Jai. Well, that was fun to have Kandita on the phone. <laughs>